King Frederick William, Frederick the Great's father, was quite likely to whip out his pistols and shoot at their wigs to set them on fire as a punishment. And there is a description of a dinner which the Archbishop of Mainz gave in the late 18th century to his fellow electors, the princes uh, who were symbolically the managing committee of the empire. A dinner that lasted from midday until nine in the evening, and while they ate, a military band provided constant music. When they had finished eating, the electors, led by the court marshal, danced on the table until they fell under it. You might say that it wasn't really safe to dine with a German prince, and the princes who were also bishops were the worst. Partly because they like practical jokes, like water spouting from the seats, or dishes or glasses with holes in them. Partly because they grew the best wines in Germany and drank them, of course. At every meal, the Prince Bishop of Münster used to empty in one draught a large silver church bell full of wine, and he expected every one of his guests to do the same. Between meals, hunting was the rule. Almost every crowned head of the time loved these killing sprees. It was the only exercise they got, after all, apart from running after women or after boys. And furthermore, since each territory was considered by its ruler as his own private estate and hunting preserve, agriculture was nearly brought to a standstill. It isn't very surprising that quite a number of these princes were on the verge of madness, impotence, alcoholism, or over the verge. They were also great collectors, and their collecting was obsessive. The Duke of Württemberg collected 4,000 different editions of the Bible. The Duke of Brunswick collected vast numbers of harpsichords and spinets, the best of which he reserved for the use of his favorite cats. Another prince decided the time of day according to his own convenience. The clocks of the state had all to be set according to the hour which he chose for his own library. And the Duke of Merseburg spent all his income on furnishing a large room with every kind of bass viol presided over by an immense double bass which was so big it could only be played from a high stool with the aid of a bow as long as a mast. So you can see that the Enlightenment didn't reach very far and you can see why the subjects of the more backward rulers envied uh, those uh, people who lived in lands like Prussia, uh, let alone France. And you can understand also why even the very limited reforms of the enlightened despots could come as a relief to their subject at a time uh, when most rulers were really drunken, incompetent tyrants. And yet these boorish clods lived in palaces, worshipped in churches, applauded in theatres that were epitomes of grace. The style of the 18th century is lighter, daintier, wittier than that of any other age. It's what we call Rococo, and it originated in France, where people were tired of the pretentious grandeur of 17th century classicism. When Louis XIV died in 1715, this ushered in a revolt that had been brewing for a long time against the stateliness and the restraints he had imposed. Imagination, grace, Comfort took over, at least for the well-to-do, and they created a world on which crude life impinged as little as possible. Furniture grew softer and less massive. Dress for men and women got lighter and brighter. 
What people wanted now was not strength, but sensibility, not ponderousness, but pleasure. And so solemnity went out, elegance and fantasy came in. Probably the most interesting French patron of literature and the arts was Madame de Pompadour, who was the mistress of Louis XV. It was Pompadour who protected and helped the writers who put together the monument of 18th century thought that was the Encyclopedia. And it was Pompadour who patronized painters like Boucher, who characteristically painted her holding a book. Color, freedom, delight, enchantment are the hallmark of 18th century painting. The enchanted exuberance of Boucher the enchanted theater of Tiepolo, the enchanted mirages of the Guardi brothers, the enchanted flippancy of Fragonard. You can see this best in the work of the most representative painter of the 18th century, Jean-Antoine Watteau, with its delicacy and charm, its superficial relations, its shimmering colors. There's nothing solid or eternal about the people and the scenes he paints. They're here to enjoy themselves in a trip, in a game, a picnic, a dance. Their relations are fragile because pleasure is fragile and transitory. And so is life. It's interesting that Watteau's best-known painting, The Embarkation, takes a traditional theme, which is a pilgrimage, and transposes it to a frivolous level. The pilgrimage to Jerusalem becomes the pilgrimage to Sithra, the island of love. Here, a group of ladies and gentlemen are embarking for Sithra, and Sitara shimmers across the water like a sort of Jerusalem, just as enchanted, but profane. And the whole scene is highly theatrical, which is another characteristic of the Rococo and of 18th century society. Rococo gardens, for example, were artificial recreations of nature with artificial waterfalls, ruins, and a, a wilderness, as they called it, that made gardens into picturesque places for dreaming and rambling. Gardens have always tried to recreate nature, but those of the 17th century had been stately, orderly creations. No shadow, no mystery, just straight beds, grand alleys, vast vistas. In the 18th century, however, you get irregularities, a whimsy, unexpected twists. And this was also reflected in a contemporary fad for exotic things. Turkish fashions, anything outlandish. There was more trade overseas. And the ships that went to the Near East and to China brought back a lot of things now that looked different. And since they looked different, they looked attractive. They looked vaporous. They looked frivolous. They fitted the contemporary protest against the old formality. Like gardens, Rococo fashions were as elaborate, as artificial as possible, from the wigs and bows and baskets to the completely useless little shoes. The more useless, the more anti-functional, the better. And this appreciation of the ephemeral in everything is especially evident in music. What, after all, could be more ephemeral than music? Not the notes printed on paper, but the performance, which in that time could not be captured or preserved. Music is the typical happening, and music was the model 
of 18th century art. It fascinated Watteau, who often painted himself as a musician. It fascinated his contemporaries. The 18th century was the great age of music, or perhaps music was the great art of the 18th century especially elegant and witty music, as epitomized by Mozart, who died in his mid-thirties, just like Watteau. Even Rococo architecture looks musical. Rococo architects built theaters and opera houses designed so that the public could enjoy each other even more than what was going on on the stage. And opera houses went on being built in Rococo style, for 200 years. And they built churches that looked like opera houses, where churches of the past were mysterious, awesome. Rococo churches are a garden of delight. There's no trace of counter-reformation hellfire. There's no trace of Puritan sobriety and restraint. Joy has replaced fear, scenery has replaced ritual, display has replaced inspiration. It's all stucco and gilt and curly cues and a lot of mirrors to reflect the light. God himself is a delight and you expect the priest to burst into an aria. Now, history doesn't pay much attention to pleasure, and frivolity is not a favorite of scholars who are made of sterner stuff. But you should remember that the lighter and softer sensibility of the Rococo period also went with greater sensitivity. Sensitivity not just to our own feelings, but to the feelings of others. More and more members of the upper classes did not want their feelings bruised. And so they didn't want to see pain or suffering, which were, after all, standard aspects of contemporary life. And it was the more sensitive people of this age, like Madame de Pompadour, for example, who began to curtail torture and public execution and the repressive and cruel legislation that had survived for centuries. It was people like these who welcomed penal reform in the last third of the 18th century, or at least who welcomed campaigns for penal reform that tried to fit punishment to crime and to social utility rather than to age-old horrors like cutting off a hand for stealing a loaf of bread. Some called for reform because they were enlightened, and I shall talk about that next time. But a lot of people wanted or accepted reform simply because their taste had changed. Their manners, their feelings had become more humane. They were more sensitive. And if you do good for selfish reasons, that's all right too. 